Hi, my name is Chris Gagne, and I am an Agile coach. I've coached over three dozen teams in both huge enterprises and small companies. Prior to that, I have close to a decade of product management experience. That makes me a bit unique among Agile coaches, who often come from Scrum Master, Project Manager, and Engineering Manager backgrounds. I've been in the trenches just like you, and I've seen more than my fair share of the good, the bad, and the ugly. This video will introduce you to the five most common events in Scrum. I've included dozens of unique tips and tricks that will help your team get the most from these events with the lowest time investment. The five events that I'll cover are Backlog Refinement, Sprint Planning, Daily Scrum, Sprint Review, and Sprint Retrospective. You can watch them all or click the links in the description to jump just to the section that you need. Enjoy, and thanks for watching. Backlog refinement is the work of refining, estimating, and ordering items in the product backlog. As a product manager, I used to spend about a quarter of my time working on my backlog. The Scrum Guide suggests that the development team also spend up to 10% of their capacity supporting backlog refinement. This usually happens in regularly scheduled events such as backlog refinement and sprint planning, but it also occurs ad hoc such as in a parking lot discussion after the daily scrum. Although backlog refinement isn't an official event in the scrum guide, I've never met a scrum master or coach who didn't advocate strongly for teams making it one. As a general rule, I discourage work from being introduced at sprint planning unless it's been previously been through a backlog refinement event with the team. The biggest reason for this is to reduce risk. If your team can't clarify an item's requirements during sprint planning, it won't be ready to pull into the sprint and will likely have to wait for the next one. If the product owner attempts to force it into the sprint anyway, the team sprint forecast won't be very accurate. However, if you hold a backlog refinement event a few days in advance of the sprint planning and the team discovers an issue, you'll have time before the sprint starts to do more research. Besides, every hour your team spends in backlog refinement is at least an hour your team won't spend in sprint planning. Before you start, I suggest having the product owner communicate a proposed list of items for refinement to the team at least a few hours before the event. This gives the team a chance to look at the stories earlier. If the product owner or scrum master are willing to conclude the event when all of these items have been refined, rather than move on to new topics, it can also be highly motivating for the team. To begin, gather the whole team and start discussing your highest ranked backlog item. Remember the phrase card, conversation, confirmation? The card is the index card, sticky note, or software entry that acts as the token for our discussion. Our discussion is the conversation. The updates we make to the card, especially the acceptance criteria, lead to the confirmation. What's in scope? Out of scope? Dependencies? Target ship date? Keep talking about and updating each backlog item until it meets your team's definition of ready. Then estimate. If you're using planning poker to estimate items, do so immediately following the discussion so that it's still fresh in your mind. If you're using affinity estimating, you can place the item in its correct relative location immediately after discussing it, or wait until you've discussed everything to sort them. Once the user story is ready and estimated, mark it as ready. I like to prefix the item's title with an asterisk to indicate that it's ready. This works great when you've got several pro forma sprints lined up following a release planning session. If you don't do release planning, you can simply create a pseudo sprint called ready and place items in that sprint. Schedule your backlog refinement events as your team sees fit. I generally suggest one shorter backlog refinement event per week, lasting at about an hour for mature teams and products. Some teams like one longer session per sprint. If your sprint planning events seem to take forever, you probably need to spend more time doing refinement. This is especially common for new teams or products. 
Sprint planning is an event in which the entire Scrum team collectively determines what work can be delivered in the next sprint and how that work will be completed. There are several steps in sprint planning. First, close out the last sprint. If the team hasn't done so already, update and close last sprint's board. Any remaining work should be carried over to the next sprint unless the product owner feels that it is no longer valuable. Otherwise, the team should assume that some work in process on those tasks will have been wasted. This is because it takes more effort to regroup and pick up where the team left off when they stop working on a task for a sprint or more. Second, determine your story point budget for the next sprint based on your historical performance and capacity and next sprint's capacity. There are a few techniques for calculating your budget. The most common are a rolling historical average in yesterday's weather. But describing them would take too long. What really matters is to stress how important the team treat this empirically. If the data tells a team that they consistently complete about 20 points a sprint, they should not attempt to complete 25 points the following sprint out of wishful thinking. Better to sign up for 20 and pick up the five points mid sprint when all of the work has been accepted. I find adherence to this evidence-based limit to be a powerful predictor of the team's overall capacity for empirical process control and thus their overall success with Agile. Third, all those good practices start sprint planning with one and a half to two sprints of stories that meet the definition of ready. Product owners and teams often find that they will want to introduce a new, unrefined story for consideration in the next sprint. For instance, many teams find that they almost always have an improvement item from the retrospective. Or a customer may have requested a small but important change to the sprint review. This step looks just like backlog refinement. Discuss, refine, split, and estimate backlog items. Fourth, load stories into the sprint backlog, respecting the sprint story point budget. Based on a good faith estimate of the complexity, uncertainty, and effort required for new and old backlog items, their historical performance, and the calculated budget for next sprint, the team publicly forecasts that they will complete these backlog items by the end of the next iteration. Especially for new teams, it can be helpful to use the fist of five voting technique to gauge the team's confidence in their forecast. Fifth, the team should discuss and commit to a sprint goal. The sprint goal guides the team as to the purpose of the work they will be doing over the next iteration. For instance, a sprint goal might be launch the new analytics beta to 10% of our customers. It should be possible to meet the sprint goal without completing the entire sprint backlog. For instance, most of the sprint backlog might be a must have for launching the beta, while a couple of the backlog items might be should haves. The beta can be launched and thus the sprint goal can be met without these should have items being completed. Six, the team should discuss how it will complete the items in the backlog. This typically takes about half the time allotted for sprint planning, so be sure to allow enough time for it. Starting at the top of your sprint backlog, the development team will discuss each item and decide how it will deliver this functionality in the sprint. As you do so, create a subtask on your board. For instance, suppose a team wants to add a new validation error to the page. There may be a task to write the tests, another to change the logic, another to update the CSS, and another to kick off automated testing and deployment. Some teams, especially newer ones, will also estimate the number of hours each task will take to complete so they can watch these burning down along with story points over the course of the sprint. Following sprint planning, any member of the development team should be able to articulate what the sprint goal is, what the team expects to complete, and at least at a high level, how the team will complete that work. One of my favorite tricks as a product owner was to ask the team to spend the 24 hours following sprint planning validating their plan for the iteration, especially if the last step of planning how the work will be completed is cut short through the time box. When that grace period ends, I would send an email to all of my stakeholders reporting on what we completed last sprint, 
what we forecast we will complete this sprint and the sprint goal that we've committed to. This is a great follow-up to the sprint review because it gives stakeholders a preview of our next iteration. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen teams make is not allowing enough time for sprint planning or doing enough backlog refinement in advance. Sprint planning should take one to two hours per week planned, so a two-week sprint should take two to four hours to plan. If you're finding that it's difficult to complete sprint planning in this time box, including determining how the team will do the work, you may need to do more backlog refinement or evaluate how this event is facilitated. Let me start by stating what the Daily Scrum is not. The Daily Scrum is not a status review or report for anyone, including product owners, Scrum masters, or stakeholders. This is both destructive and common enough that I feel it's important to call this out right at the beginning. Instead, the Daily Scrum is a chance for the team to transparently expect and adapt how their sprint is going. It is an opportunity for course correction, not micromanagement. Even the physical orientation of the participants at a Daily Scrum is telling. Are they collaboratively huddling in a circle? Or is there one person in power at the front with the rest of the development team meekly answering questions? I say this because the driving ethos and daily outcomes of your team's daily scrum are more important than its exact manifestation. That said, here's a format that I found works reasonably well. First, start the daily scrum at the same time and place every single day. Some teams like to skip the daily scrum on days that they conduct sprint review and or sprint planning, but this is a missed chance to reconnect before these important events. Ideally, your team should have a dedicated space with either a physical or electronic task board and burn down chart visible to everyone. If you are distributed or remote, video is better than audio. Start the daily scrum on time, even if much of the team is missing. Within a few days, attendance should improve as being late to a meeting in progress is more uncomfortable than being late to a meeting that hasn't started yet. Next, each development team member answers three questions right from the Scrum Guide as concisely as possible. What did I do yesterday that helped the development team meet the sprint goal? What will I do today to help the development team meet the sprint goal? And do I see any impediments that prevent me or the development team from meeting the sprint goal? As a member of the development team is speaking, watch out for the following. First, is everyone else looking directly at the person speaking and paying full attention? It can be a fun game for the speaker to look for anyone who isn't paying attention and nominate them as the next speaker. Second, are they speaking directly to tasks that are visible to the whole team on the board, or are they working on something else? I once had a mentor who told me that we should consider any effort towards work not on the board as an act of sedition because it deeply impacts the product owner's ability to support the team and saps the team of velocity made good against the sprint goal. Third, sometimes answering these questions can spark an intense discussion. In order to keep the daily scrum to 15 minutes or less, any team member has the authority to designate the current topic a parking lot item to be discussed with any interested parties immediately following the daily scrum. Any individual who does not wish to be present for that discussion need not attend. Next, examine the team's burned down chart and incomplete sprint backlog items. Does the team still feel confident that they can meet the sprint goal and finish everything in the sprint backlog by the end of the sprint? And no, meeting the sprint goal and finishing everything in the sprint backlog are not the same thing. If not, why? Is there a course correction that will enable the team to succeed? If not, should one or more backlog items from the bottom of the sprint backlog be removed? This inspection and adaptation will improve the team's chance of success and give the product owner a chance to provide early warning to their stakeholders if the goal will not be met. A couple of other useful hints. It's not the Scrum Master's job to always facilitate the daily Scrum only to ensure that it happens smoothly and within the 15 minute time box. Also, people who are not on the team are always welcome to attend, so long as they do not interfere with the event. For instance, 
Watch out for stakeholders demanding status updates or addition to the current Sprint's backlog. These sorts of requests should be directed directly to the product owner. That's the essence of the daily scrum. Feel free to experiment with the format. Be sure to track whether or not your experiment helped your team meet the sprint goal or provide an early warning. Sprint review is held at the end of every sprint to celebrate the team's success, inspect the product increment delivered by the development team, and adapt the product backlog as necessary. It's also an opportunity for the Scrum team to demonstrate transparency about their output and process to their stakeholders so as to foster mutual trust. The event is attended by the entire Scrum team and the stakeholders and customers invited by the product owner. Some teams find it useful to complete their first review or two privately so they can get the hang of it before inviting stakeholders and customers. That stakeholders who attend many disorganized events may not come back for more. Here's a sample agenda that covers the most important points of a sprint review. First, the product owner welcomes their stakeholders and explains what product backlog items have and have not been fully completed. Second, the development team briefly talks about their experiences during the sprint, including any impediments that arose and how they resolve them. Note that most teams complete their sprint retrospective event after the sprint review so they can include what happened at the sprint review in the retrospective. So be aware that you might not have the most refined responses yet. Also, this isn't an opportunity for stakeholders to criticize the team's process. If a stakeholder has this type of concern, they should discuss it with the scrum master and or product owner after the event. Third, the development team just demonstrates each fully completed backlog item, ideally from the end user's perspective. Show results, not code. Demonstrating backlog items on stage can illustrate that the work integrated correctly. While demonstrating from production is nice, it's not necessarily required. Stakeholders should be encouraged to ask questions and provide feedback, and anyone on the team can answer. Fourth, the product owner can share forward-looking updates. What's the current state of the backlog? Have any longer-term forecasts, such as release date and scope, changed? Fifth, all attendees participate in an adaptation exercise. Having inspected the product increment and backlog presented transparently by the Scrum team, what adaptation should we make? It can also be helpful to talk about the changes in the market or other team external events that could impact the team's future plans. The primary output of the sprint review is an updated product backlog that reflects the event. This event can take up to one hour per week of iteration, but most teams and stakeholders will want to complete it in less time, typically 30 to 60 minutes for a two week sprint. The retrospective is far and away the most important event in Scrum, if not for all agile practitioners. Although empirical process control is omnipresent in Scrum, nowhere is it better represented than at the retrospective. Put another way, I still envision a team being highly successful even after they've jettisoned every other role, artifact, and event, so long as they're still doing retrospectives. This is because a team can experiment with changes to roles, artifacts, and events, not to mention plenty of other factors using retrospectives. For instance, suppose a team decides during the retrospective to reduce the time spent doing backlog refinement by 50%, and they're still genuinely happy with that choice a few sprints later. Who's to say they shouldn't make that change? So how can we conduct our first retrospective? Personally, I'm a huge fan of the five-step retrospective popularized by Esther Derby and Diana Larson, authors of the book Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great. Retrospectives can get stale really quickly, so teams find it helpful to change how they do retrospectives often. So long as your retrospective covers the following five steps, you're in good hands. Step one is to set the stage. This is a good chance to break the ice with your team and remind yourselves why this is so important. I have a few activities I like for this step, and I recommend choosing two of them. First, I'd suggest reading Norm Kerr's Retrospective Prime Directive as a team. 
which is, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. This helps to create a collaborative environment for learning and continuous improvement instead of blaming individuals. Second, I like to ask each team member to share just one word about how the sprint went for them. This will give everyone a good sense of the mood in the room. Third, I like to invite team members to share a genuine word of specific appreciation for another member of the team. Step two is to gather data. What happened in the sprint? I like to use a positives, deltas, and insights collection device. Ask each team member to come up with as many positives, deltas, or things they'd like to change and insights as possible. Have them write each positive, delta, and insight individually on sticky notes or their digital equivalent. When the team has run out of thoughts or the time box has elapsed, place the sticky notes on the wall and group like items together. Step three is to generate insights. I like to add a brief intermediary step, which is to choose the top positives, deltas, and or insights that we'd like to focus on, about one to three total. Once you have the top one to three items, dig in more on each one. The book, Agile Retrospectives, has a good activity called Prioritize with Thoughts that can make this go faster. If a positive reads, the team is doing a good job of collaborating with one another, and a delta reads, our staging server keeps going down, try to understand the root cause of these conditions. Some teams find it helpful to ask why five times, give or take, until you get to your root cause. Agile retrospective suggests other exercises as well. As a hint, if you're rarely surprised by your root causes, you may not be digging deep enough. Step four is all about actions. I like to expand this into decisions and actions. For each item, discuss as a team suggestions about how you can persist and deepen the positive, change or minimize the delta, and capitalize on the insight. You'll find that your suggestions naturally fall into two buckets. Decisions, which are changes to your team's working agreement, and actions, which are simply new backlog items. Suppose the team is tired of events starting late due to tardiness. The team could vote to add a rule to their working agreement that imposes a penalty for being late. Or suppose the team discovers that their staging server needs several hours of maintenance. The team could decide to add a user story to the backlog that reads, as a developer, I have a more reliable staging server so I can develop software more effectively. Try to stay focused here. It's better to have one or two improvement items for the next iteration than to have too much to change all at once. Step five is wrap up. If you haven't done a round of appreciations yet, this is a nice time. Spend a few minutes retrospecting on the retrospective. How did it go for the team? What would they like to try next time? Your team should run a retrospective at the end of every sprint. If your team is doing Kanban or one-week sprints, it's okay to do a retrospective every two weeks. It's also useful to hold a retrospective at the end of any significant event, just as the multi-team release planning, a large release, or following an incident. If you're retrospecting an outage or incident, don't call this event a post-mortem. This makes the event a little too negative in conception subtly implying that the team killed something or someone. Instead, just use retrospective, or the military term, after action review. So that's a reasonable retrospective format that you can use for your first several sprints. Talk to your team's agile coach for more ideas on how to keep your retrospective fresh and interesting. <laughs>